To kick things off, why did you invest in Palantir? And over time, has your opinion on the company or the company's potential change? And what is the ultimate vision, the ultimate goal for Palantir in your mind? So I invested in Palantir in 2021 when after some elementary research, I saw that their software could be used in a lot of industries. Uh, and as someone who missed Tesla and missed a lot of these other really good platform based companies like Shopify, uh, even though I was using Shopify, I realized like I don't want to miss another platform based approach, even though it was a little bit early uh, that I saw the potential was there. And then after doing a lot more due diligence and looking through all the case studies on their website, I was like, wow, they seem to be having their fingers in everywhere, you know, when it comes to government, commercial, just like in, in all different places. And so the potential back then, I, which I still think is a potential today, is this could be the most important software company in the world if their operating system-esque software, Foundry, Gotham, AIP now, scales to thousands of clients across the world, which I think in the next decade, it has the potential to do so if we all agree that every business has a massive amount of data, that data needs to be understood. It is incredibly difficult to process data and actually gain business intelligence from it, especially at the levels and, and the really micro granular levels that Palantir is able to do for companies. And as a result of that, if that's valuable, then Palantir is going to upsell a lot of these clients on uh, products that will make them a lot more money. And that's how they become profitable over the next decade. So you said the foundation of your re research was a bit rudimental. Now you've deep dived into the company, you've been researching it for a couple of years. Is that thesis still intact? Yeah, I mean, like everything I've seen since 2021, so almost two years now has been uh, really just an understanding of like, where do they have their fingers in? So when you get $400 million from the CDC, and then you get um, uh, a deal with Panasonic Energy of North America, and then you get a deal with the, uh, the Space Command, <laughs> and then you get a deal in Ukraine and then you get a deal with BP. I mean, like there's just so many, so many examples that I've, I've seen over the past two years, which is reaffirms the same thesis. We had three entire conferences with some of the biggest multi-billion dollar companies in the world are saying Palantir worked with us and they actually solved our problems and we are willing to be with them for the next second. It's like you get you get to realize like the reason the company hasn't scaled massively yet is simply because they haven't really figured out sales. And it, it with a product focused company, you don't expect them to figure out sales this easily. But sales can be figured out. What can't be figured out is if you're selling, you know, a, a pile of crap. And it doesn't seem like over the past two years, the deals that they've gotten, which com com uh, customer count has grown pretty significantly over the past two years, even if the rate of the growth has declined a little bit. It seems like the th th thesis is intact and they just have to figure out sales and they'll be good to go. So Palantir is a founder led company. Uh, they've been working on their technology years before the value was completely obvious. That's given them a head start on competition. AI is at the core of their products and is and AI is also at the start of a mega cycle moving forward. Does Palantir have the hallmarks and the setup to being a completely legendary company moving forward with taking all those pieces and putting them together? Yes. Uh, and the reason I think that, and it's it, the reason I think all of us have the ability to even uh, have the potential to think that is because of the conference that we had, their AIP conference and the new product they released, right? So ChatGPT goes mainstream a couple months ago. And then Palantir says, okay, this is going to be the new architecture in which software and humans uh, are able to communicate the paradigm by which humans work with software. And in the next 10 years, we don't even know if software will still be a thing because AI might eat the very foundations of software in and of itself. So I think CodeStrap made a video a long time ago once ChatGPT really started scaling saying people are going to interact with information in a different way. And what is Palantir? It's an information processing company at the end of the day. It's, hey, you have this data. We are going to help you gain insights from that data and you will be able to make massive actionable uh, actions because of those because of those insights driven from the data. So if you build a AI oriented platform, a, a platform that leverages LLMs, which have fundamentally changed how we interact with information for an enterprise. And that enterprise then can use the infrastructure you built rooted in artificial intelligence to save money and expand revenue. Then you've got a hell of a business over the next 10 years, especially if that overall market is catering at like 40, $50 billion a year, going to be worth a couple trillion by 2033. So then the question simply becomes, you know, can you implement it in a safe way? Can you protect the data? Can the data be confidential? Can the data actually drive results? How much time to value does it take for the data to actually uh, lead to some type of insight? And I think what we saw at AIPCon, which was put on in two months after releasing an entire platform, which is just insane, was that these clients were using it for a couple of weeks. They already see the value. Palantir is getting ready to scale this to more clients because the CEO is saying they're getting a massive amount of demand inbound. And then it's just a question of if they can execute on it. And if they can, this AI wave that we're getting is going to be real. 
and Pounter will uh, hopefully be in the center of it. Yeah, and something that you spoke about then was that Kagar moving forward. And I think with investing, sometimes, you know, you can go down one rabbit hole after another and it can get really complicated. And sometimes you can just pull it back to a simple thought exercise. And I think that thought exercise is, is the company still growing at a fast rate? And how many years of growth into the future can Palantir have? For me, Palantir has both of those. It has a good growth rate moving forward and it has many years of growth. Is that something you think really applies to Palantir? And how does that sort of shape your thesis into the company? Yeah, I, you know, they've got it for 18% revenue growth this year. Uh, I do think that is sandbagging. Uh, I think they want to keep expectations low because why would you keep expectations super high? Especially, you know, the reason people don't realize they guided for low guidance when their stock was in the gutter. And like, like that's kind of good because how much more can the stock go down, right? It's it's, it's different if the stock is up at a premium and then you say, oh, we're not going to grow at the 30% CAGR we said we were going to grow at. And then the market tanks you versus if your stock's seven bucks and then you lower guidance, like is the market really going to tank you or are you going to be trading under book value? So at some level, um, I think that the guidance is sandbagged. And I think if you believe the CEO that says we're getting 12x the amount of demand in, a, you know, in, in one month versus all we got last year, then you put the pieces together and then you ask yourself the real question, which is, is the product, do you think the product is worth having that much demand over? And that's like the trillion dollar question, because that's where as a shareholder, that's your due diligence. Do you think this product co-signs co with the synergies the CEO is saying in terms of the business application of it in the context of demand? And I personally want to believe him. I think that's correct. I don't think we see it in Q2 this year. I think Q3, Q4 is when we see that revenue scale. But if that's correct, then yeah, there's a big ass market for AI and Balancer is going to capture a decent amount of that. And as a result, it's going to make a lot of money over the next 10 years. Yeah. So I think the setup is there for, you know, some really great growth for a long amount of time. Can you see anything outside of macro, which could maybe slow them down here? Because at the moment, obviously, we've had a macro downturn. Software sales have been slowing down. There's there's a slowdown across the board. But other than that, I can't really see a good reason for Palantir's growth to, you know, completely slow or stagnate. Yeah, I, I don't see a, a major catalyst for that. I think uh, I think if com competition becomes a, a really hard thing to deal with. So if the Microsofts of the world, the Snowflakes of the world, the potential Databricks of the world steal clientele in a way that's cheaper, more effective, more efficient, less complicated, and they get the job done, then yeah, that's a headwind for Palantir. I mean, that's going to be tough to deal with. But if that doesn't happen, which we could reasonably conclude, it's going to be hard for some of those competitors to necessarily do exactly what Palantir is doing. Um, you know, and, and, and why do I say that? Because the, there is an NHS contract up for sale, almost half a billion dollars, more than half a billion. And there's only one real bidder from America going for that contract, which is Palantir. And you got then you got to ask yourself, it's like, this is a real question. Why isn't Snowflake bidding for that? Why can't Snowflake manage, you know, a half a billion dollar contract? Why can't Databricks do that? Why can't Microsoft do it? Why can't Amazon do it? It's like, well, there's a really unique differentiating moat that Palantir has to be able to resolve this issue. It's not just because they're Palantir, right? It's because they have unique products. So if that's the case, if there is no competition, the market's ready to go. As you said, this is ready for them to take. Um, it's just a question of they can execute and fully take it. And you mentioned the NHS contract. Are you, are you confident? Do you think it's in the bag for Palantir? Yeah, I, th I think we're getting that contract. I mean, like, if we were, if we don't get the NHS contract, that to me will be two things. It'll be a travesty on UK politics and propaganda. And the real people that are going to suffer are the people in the UK that get crappy healthcare. I mean, like, all right, if you want to deal with that, then you can deal with that. But number two is, um, it, it will mean that if it's not for the political reason, then there was a actual technological problem with their software that another company, some other IT firm could solve better than Palantir or a host of, uh, of companies if they split up this contract, which if that's the case, I think it's it, 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 either we're all wrong on this thesis on Palantir and it's absolute garbage, you know, setting up COVID vaccine distributions within two weeks is absolute garbage for some reason, or uh, Rishi Sunik decided that he let politics get over pr uh, potential. And I just, I, he's a techno optimist. He's not the type of guy, the PM of, of the United Kingdom, that seems like he will succumb to the wishes of, of, of propagandists in the United Kingdom and not actually change the healthcare system, which he has promised on the campaign trail that this was his number one priority to fix healthcare in the UK. So if that's the case, and then he's meeting with Alex Karp at a baseball game, and then Palantir is getting a $31 million contract to transfer a bunch of data into the federated data platform, I think the deal is getting done.